Hey folks, this is Mike Dolphson from the Microsoft Education Team, and we are on the latest episode of Remote Learning with Microsoft EDU. And this is the show we've been having regularly since the global pandemic has shut many schools down. But what we've been doing is pulling the best people from all around the world to join us. And today we have two of the best. We have Cal Armstrong and Tom Grissom. It's like double trouble. I've got two magician icons I use to represent them in the deck because they're both going to do some magical stuff. And I, I know that Cal loves rainbows and unicorns, so expect the best from Cal. First, we're going to do latest news and updates really quick. We have the Microsoft ED remote learning site. That's where we have all of our latest and greatest updates, news, products, etc. There's the Teams for Education Quick Start Guide. That's to get up and running really fast with Microsoft Teams. It's a PDF file designed for educators to ramp up quickly, and it's in lots of languages. And then lastly, join the remote learning community. That is where we have over 5,000 educators who are collaborating together, working together, learning from each other. The Microsoft product team is in there. I'm in there. We're working to help answer questions and support other educators, and we encourage people to join. So today's update links, a couple of really good ones that extend off our new special education and accessibility site. Uh, one is the early education and special education site. So we have the main special ed site that we launched. There's another one designed for early education and younger children, and that page just went live a couple of days ago. The link is there. And the other one is a separate important topic that doesn't always get as much coverage, the twice exceptional or 2E. And that might be where there's a, an advanced student who is also, uh, let's say, a student with dyslexia or dysgraphia. They call that twice exceptional or 2E. We just launched a new MEC page delving deep into that, which is also really important during remote learning. And lastly, a new YouTube playlist. There's all these great video and screen recording tools coming out. Tom just mentioned before the show that he just got the new stream screen recording launched. That's launched across all of North America now and, and Western Europe. And by Wednesday morning, it'll be fully rolled out globally. So all the great video and screen recording tools and quick tips we have in one nice little playlist there. So be sure to check that out. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Cal Armstrong from Appleby. Cal is a legend. He's a, you know, if you were to say the old school, and Cal's probably my age range-ish to say, Back in the era of the Monsters of Rock, those like big rock, heavy metal tours, uh, Cal would be a monster of pedagogy. So Cal, I'm going to turn it over to you, my friend, and it's great to have you on the show. Well, thanks very much, folks. Um, that's a, quite, quite the introduction. Yeah, um, I, I, this is quite interesting because I don't actually teach from PowerPoint, so this will be this will be curious to see if I I manage to actually pull it off with any kind of finesse. Um, yeah, uh, whenever we have a question, make sure that you use one of the techniques you've got of asking, either here in the Q and A or on Twitter. Once we are all done, you can certainly touch base. And Mike was kind enough to share the Microsoft community that's available to everyone. So I'm just going to dive right in. They've given me 15 minutes, and I tend to go over everything. So uh, I'll we'll start my timer and, and get uh, get right to business. When Mike said innovative remote teaching, um, I thought it was important to notice that to, to recognize that most folks don't think what they do is innovative. Um, they often, as teachers, we work by ourselves, and and we don't we don't acknowledge all the, the things that we actually do and how well we actually do it. And most teachers don't get a lot of appreciation for the amount of effort they do on a daily basis. And Danny Steele, who's on Twitter at Steele Thoughts, often shares those kind of supportive messages. And that was the one I captured the other day. And we don't capture the best things that happen in our classroom. And, and when they do happen, we have them in our memory and we don't tend to write them down. We don't tend to share them with others. So I really do wanna make sure that, that there's a sort of shout out to all those teachers out there who are doing an amazing job um, under these incredibly trying trying conditions. So just a shout out to all of you folks. Every deliberate step you've taken through this process is innovative because we've never been here before. Um, this is all brand new to us. 
even though I've been teaching online, this is not teaching online. Teaching online is when I had two months to prepare all my lessons. Uh, all my students had signed up ahead of time. That's not what we've got right now. So when I thought about what was going on, the evacuation of Dunkirk was what came to mind. That if you don't remember your history, uh, the British Expeditionary Force was caught on the shores of France and they couldn't lift them off uh, off the, the uh, beaches quick enough using the facilities of the, the British Navy. So they asked all of these basically gentlemen sailors uh, to cross the channel and lift the, the, the boys off the shores. And as you can see from the image that I've shared here, they were pleasure boats. They were they were river boats. They were not meant to go out into the open water. So what we had was a bunch of, of, of people who were put in a position that they were not prepared for, that they had not trained for, but they had a job that had to be done and they did it. And that's really where we're sitting right now, a position where you're doing all the best work you can do and being innovative with everything that you do. And one of the best examples I've seen so far is this, that a teacher was using the snipping tool, the old snipping tool, uh, as the whiteboard because that's what she knew and that's what she had and that's what she saw and that's what was convenient to her. Now, when she shared this, obviously I talked to her about OneNote and, and the Microsoft whiteboard, but that was innovative. That was problem solving at its best. What have I got? What can I do? And I need to do this and I'm gonna make it happen. And she did. So shout out to that teacher down in, uh, I believe it was Tennessee. And I have to admit that I'm coming from a really big place of privilege. Um, this is my setup at home. I've got my digital tablet. I've got a uh, two screen uh, desktop. I really want for nothing. Anything I want to do, I can I can make happen. So whenever I talk about something, I recognize that that's not the situation for everyone. And you need to adapt to your situation. Innovative for me is not going to be innovative for everyone else because the, the resources are different. So whenever whatever I say, you know, take it with a grain of salt through the lenses that you have to work with. What I do try to do, though, is keep it simple. Um, always try to look through a heuristic, some kind of map that really makes things easier for everyone. For me, I look at choice, voice, and rejoice. And what I've got here are my choices. I've got the OneNote HyperDoc. You're all familiar with HyperDocs through that excellent book that's been published on HyperDocs in the Google space, but really a OneNote document is just a HyperDoc. It's just a way of collecting information for the student, uh, activities for the student to work through, links for the student to explore, and exercises for the student to try with as many options throughout as possible. So whenever you create a OneNote document inside of your class notebook, you're really giving the students choices as you layer on the different opportunities for them. And the nice thing about OneNote, of course, is that it accepts anything. Um, Absolutely anything you run into that you can store in a OneDrive or post on a web page or videotape, videotape, video record, uh, you can uh, you can put uh, into your OneNote uh, notebook. The other choice is one of my favorites uh, is the OneNote escape room or choose your own adventure. And that just builds a structure from the HyperDoc into something more, more, more schematic. In this case, this was a choose your own adventure I did with my faculty. And you'll notice at the bottom, I've just made it a story where they can go through different doors to try out different things. And you can do that with students to give them the choice to try different activities based on whatever theme you're working with. This was tech, uh, technology PD, but it could absolutely be anything. I'm a math teacher, so of course it would be math. There's been a lot of talk about breakout rooms. Um, one thing we tried with uh, with my students was break them into different rooms. What I love about the, the one Windows interface is that you can use emojis anywhere. And if you haven't used the Windows period emoji keyboard in Windows 10, it's awesome. Uh, so I have Team Ninja Cat, Team Ghost, and Team, of course, Unicorn. Oh, sorry, that's Team Zebra in this in this group. It, anything you can do to add a little bit of humor really does help, especially when we're working at a distance. And in this case, it was just an activity for each of the channels. Uh, broke them up into three groups, created a Microsoft whiteboard for each of the groups, uh, put in some sorting cards so that they were self-checking, all the cards fit together with the answer and the question on each. And I think really that's what you want to do when it comes to giving them choices, having some way of them making sure that they're right without your intervention, without them necessarily looking up the answers somewhere else. Give them some way in the activity that they can check to make sure they're correct and can move on from there. 
The next one is form branching. Now, this is really an old thing. This has been around for a while. Uh, but form branching really lets you take a multiple choice question and branch from there and give them some other option. And again, that's part of that self-checking thing. If they've got it wrong, give them a way to get it right without necessarily your intervention. We don't always have the option to be synchronous with every student all the time. And so letting them know whether they're right or wrong through some kind of structure activity um, really gives, the, gives them the opportunity to work by themselves. For example, I teach at a boarding school. So my students start in Turkey and go around the globe uh, to Mongolia. So during the day, I'm not with my students all the time. And so it can be a challenge for them to make sure they're right. And by doing activities like this, you can make sure that they can move along at their own pace. Lastly, and this is again a really technical one, is, is the use of Power App, uh, Power Automate. Uh, the used to call it Flow, but what it is is that scripting language that exists within the Office 365 structure. Now it's pretty technical and it's pretty <laughs> it's challenging sometimes, but it really does let you take results and rework them in the way that you want. And the example I have here is how we figured out how to delay a post into Teams. So we would go to a form, as you see in the upper right hand corner, write your message, set when you want to do it. And there's a bit of an issue with the time, but that's a whole other story. Set your time when you want it released and the, the Power Automate process will release that message uh, when you want. And that was a concern of one of our teachers because they wanted to sort of stack, stack things up uh, for their students and couldn't do that. And Power Automate gave her the option. What we also did was we used it for our attendance. We had the students create a form or sorry, answer a form and put their their how they're feeling. The, the social emotional one that Microsoft put out. But we added the class and now it goes through a Power Automate process where it sends that result to the teacher's spreadsheet so they don't have to go to the whole class, the whole uh, a whole uh, student spreadsheet. They can go to their individual class spreadsheet because Power Automate is automatically filtering those uh, results into their individual spreadsheets. It's just that little bit of thing that works in the background to give the uh, both the student and the teacher in this case a little bit of choice. What we see here is the next level voice, giving the students voice so that they can actually um, be heard within your classroom space. When we when this first started this whole remote learning, my one of my first tweets was, please, if you're going to have a meeting with your students, turn your video on. I don't expect and I really even don't want my students video to be on. I teach teenagers and that can often be uncomfortable for some of them, but it's really important that they see you. They see you emote. And as I was mentioning to Tom before we started, I took sign language for, for a number of years, uh, a, a long while ago. And one of the things that the teacher said was, everyone talks so much with what they what they move and the way their eyes and their face, their face act. And so they, the kids really need to see that. They need to see you the way they've always seen you. And so please turn your cameras on. Of course, the next one <laughs> with OneNote is, as I've mentioned before, OneNote captures everything beautifully. So the student has every possible way of expressing themselves. So please let them. Don't, don't just say, you know, write your response. Videotape the response, audio tape your response, draw your response. We do a weekly reflection at our school to check in with our students on how they're feeling. And it's been really great to see the students actually just record their voices and say, here's how I'm feeling and just, just say it. And then of course, when I respond, I record a message back to them uh, to mimic what they're doing. The same goes with seeing their learning and letting them see you teach. Now, obviously, if you're using OneNote, you see their, their learning because that's where all of their content is. But let them see you teach. Let them see you explain how you structured the lesson and why you structured it that way. They're so used to classroom teaching that they know the mechanisms in a classroom space. They don't know the online world, especially the one that we're making in this emergency. So make them aware of why you did things in that particular fashion, how it did, uh, how it happened that it worked out that way and where it might have went wrong. And lastly, make sure that it's flexible. Um, and that's just flexibility in absolutely everything. And if there's one thing that students and teachers, administrators, uh, appreciate is flexibility. Give us the sort of the breathing room um, to deal with this situation because we're all rolling through this a little bit differently. And along with voice, there's the opportunity to be silent. Uh, one thing we've noticed in the online space is it needs to be slower and you need to wait a little bit longer. And so when you're doing an online presentation, an online workshop, an online lesson, just be silent for a bit. 
and and become comfortable with that. And the Phantom Toll Booth is one of my favorite books. It's great for math teachers, it's great for any teacher, and it's great for students because it reframes um, learning and understanding in many different ways. And the, the, the phrase that I have on the board, I'm not, I'm not gonna repeat it to you, is really um, sort of pulling at that idea that silence is, is often a good thing and it's, it's okay for, for not to say anything for a while. And lastly, rejoice. And that has all to do with that humor, that, that passion, that, that love we all have for the classroom and making it visible to the students every day. The first one, of course, we often have little control over. I have to give marks to my students as much as I, I don't want to, especially in this situation. So I make sure that as much as I can, I give feedback um, more than I ever have in terms of how they're doing and how they can do better uh, and, and, and how they can improve. And as much again, not just the written, but the audio and the video, giving them that sort of flip grid feedback that they're, used, they're not necessarily used to. Um, I've tried to do it with Flipgrid, even just announcements to my home forum, my advisor group, the people, the students I work with uh, um, in an off class basis, um, just giving them videos and to their parents explaining what I'm doing, how I'm doing and to sort of encouraging them along. Making it easy for them. Um, that has to do with it was trying to making it flow for them so they don't have any impediments. As you sort of sort of saw as I was working through my slides, I put a bitly as often as I could. Never use a full link, especially, and I apologize to Microsoft, especially their sharing links that are 20,000 characters long. Just collapse that into a bit.ly. Bit.ly is free, tiny URL is free. Uh, make a little mnemonic that goes at the end, put today's date so it sometimes makes it unique. Um, but use those, those URL shorteners or edit the link when you're putting it into OneNote to make it smaller. Um, just to make those little impediments that when you do it, 25 to 30 students don't have to look at something complicated, don't have to figure something out. You spending that one extra second, 20 extra seconds, multiplied by 30 kids really does begin to add up. Share what you learn as much as you can. Um, we've got lots of ways to keep in touch, but also share when you fail. It was a lot of fun. We did an activity two weeks ago with my grade tens and I, it was an utter disaster. And I've been teaching online, I should know better, but it was just, I mean, there was fire coming off the screens and it was it was so rewarding to speak to my colleagues on my next course meeting to explain them how badly it went and how I took next steps to make it better. Um, share when you fail. Um, it is a learning experience. And last but not least, just rejoice. Um, just credit yourself for all the work that you're doing because you're doing something that we've never done before. Um, this is all brand new for us. So please keep in touch. Lots of ways to keep in touch. I've shared my Twitter several times. Um, you can certainly search for me online. There's some great Facebook groups out there for Office 365, Microsoft Teams, and OneNote. Uh, Mike shared the MIE um, Microsoft team as well. There's Reddit. Reddit is a great source for information. You can keep yourself anonymous. Um, you might want to have several accounts in case whatever else you do on Reddit. Uh, and that's my 15 minute timer. Uh, and last but not least, and I apologize to all the Microsoft technicians out there, but there's the user voice. And the user voice is the way for you to bring your ideas to Microsoft on how they can improve their product. And all of them, all the products in Microsoft have a user voice. And if you visit it there, you can search for the ones that the ideas that are already there, vote for them so that you can agree. And the more people vote, the higher it moves up in the ranking but also bring up your own ideas. How other, how else can you improve the Microsoft products? So I uh, apologize to all those technicians who might be swamped with new ideas, but that's really how change can happen at Microsoft. So last quote from the Phantom Toll Booth, and we'll pass it on to Mr. Grissom. Thank you, Cal, and welcome Tom. Thanks for joining today. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And include system audio coming up and about a five second delay here. And tell me if you can see my slides. Looking good. Okay. So my name is Tom Grissom. I'm the director of the Instructional Technology Center at Eastern Illinois University. And the picture on the slide that you're seeing is the background image is our Instructional Technology Center. And our philosophy here is kind of a mixture of old school and new school. So you see some very traditional equipment uh, in our Instructional Technology Center. 
um, from the laminator, the paper, construction paper. We provide our students with markers and scissors and glue sticks, all kinds of bulletin board supplies. And we serve everybody from pre-kindergarten all the way through graduate school. So I still think it's very important to have the physical manipulatives. And as everybody is now working from home and schooling from home, uh, they don't have, they can't take advantage of some of these resources. So all of us are kind of struggling uh, with some of those challenges. Uh, we also have uh, our eight PCs with webcams and microphones. So any student can come in and create a webcast, screen recording, podcast. If you look in the very far back corner, you see a green screen area where students can come in and just do a quick little one minute or five minute video. And I'll say more about that uh, in a few moments. So we try to provide that physical environment. So one of the challenges is how do we bring some of this into the online world? So I want to begin with, since I work in the College of Education, we live and breathe pedagogy. And especially during these times of emergency remote learning, and Cal did a good job explaining that what we're really doing right now is not distance learning. Distance learning is a little bit more formal. We have months to prepare. This situation was just thrown upon us and everybody's you know, doing the best that we possibly can given the situation. So one of my uh, theories uh, that I always like to refer to uh, is cognitive load theory. And I always say with cognitive load theory is there's bad news and there's good news. And if you're like me, I want the bad news first. So here's the bad news regarding cognitive load theory. The mind can only process so much new information at a given time. All right, and we certainly are all feeling that in times like these. I think everybody can relate to that. Everybody's had that point where they just hit that saturation point and we can't take anything in. And we need to be uh, you know, cognizant of that as teachers. And Cal mentioned, you know, the social emotional uh, learning and everything going on in our students' lives. That's taking mental energy away from the learning process. So we have to be flexible and adaptable. Uh, the good news is that there are no known limits to what can be stored and processed at one time. And that takes us into the long term memory. And this was research that goes back to the 1980s by Sweller. So cognitive load theory is one of those things that I always want to keep front of mind as I'm designing instruction, whether distance education or this remote learning situation. Okay, so pedagogy first. Uh, as I said, one of the things I want to talk about with innovative pedagogy is uh, one of the books that I always recommend people uh, review as kind of a, a good review and overview of the evidence-based research that's out there on effective teaching and learning is a book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. And they go through several different categories and uh, I just want to mention a few. You also see on the left hand side, I have listed, I think, 11 different uh, Microsoft apps, and these can be used throughout this process. But probably one of the first important things is repetition is so important for learning. If you ask any elementary teacher, you know, they'll say repetition is the mother of all learning. You have to repeat, repeat, repeat. And that's so true. But just re repeating something's not enough. The way that we have to re the way that we repeat is also important and space practice comes into play there where it's more effective to practice over time over every other day or weeks in order for that uh, information to go from short term memory into long term memory. Retrieval practice, we need to provide those those opportunities for our students out there to recall that information and then interleaving in the book make it stick. They use an example of a, a baseball player taking hitting practice where the pitcher will throw them like 10 curve balls in a row and then 10 fastballs. Well, that's not an authentic experience. We need to mix things up. So if the batter doesn't know if it's a curveball coming, curveball, fastball, fastball, curveball, that kind of mixes things up and is a more authentic experience. Um, the other things, elaboration, desirable difficulties and reflections. There's all kinds of ways that we can use some of these Microsoft apps. And of course, OneNote's one of my favorites. Uh, but reflection, so, something as simple in a OneNote notebook, uh, particularly the class uh, notebook, every student has their own individual notebook that they can record weekly what their reflection uh, about the learning for that week. Also, some more themes. One of the challenges, particularly today with the remote learning, is the decision whether to go synchronous or asynchronous. Again, we have to remember the situation that our students are in and uh, you know, take those take those uh, needs into account. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in the interest of time, but another phrase that you hear often from educators, particularly now during these times, is Maslow before Blooms. Maslow uh, developed the hierarchy of needs where students have to be comfortable with the very, very basics. 
you know, food, clothing, shelter. In today's modern times, somebody would say Wi-Fi, but those are all needs before a student becomes comfortable and can accept uh, new information coming in. Another subject dear to my heart is accessibility and universal design for learning. Designing for all students helps every, or particular students helps every student out there. And Microsoft does a really good job with tools like Immersive Reader and the dictation feature that I don't think enough people are aware of yet. And then, of course, formative and summative assessment, Microsoft Forms. Cal shared some examples there. And then two challenges I list on this page. Lab classes and internships are certainly challenges for us at the university level, but there are creative ways to address that as well, as well as BYOD, bring your own device. And that's another area where Microsoft shines because it works on Android, it works on iOS, it works on the Mac desktop, the Windows desktop, and even Chromebooks through the browser. So let's move over here to demo mode here. I developed a system that I've called various names over the years, but onboarding is the name that seems to stick. Uh, onboarding uh, is a result of the last 10 years of just evolving different things with OneNote. And then about five years ago, I became interested in light boards. And a light board, if you've ever seen those, it's just a sheet of glass where the instructor will write with a, a neon pen and the, the text flows in front of them. And whenever I was investigating those range anywhere from, you know, a, a few hundred dollars up to thousands of dollars. And it got me to thinking, how could I adapt OneNote and all the power that digital inking has? And anybody that follows me on Twitter knows that I'm a huge digital ink, pan, ink fan. So I developed this system that's just simply a $50 webcam. And if you look at the YouTube videos, that's what I used to create, record this, a $50 webcam, and then just simply a screencast but layering it in such a way that the ink appears over my shoulder. So let's take a watch of onboarding. Switcher, and then we take this, we're recording it in one take, so it's very much like a face-to-face -face class. It's not going to be perfect, but we also do not have to deal with the post-production and a little bit of that extra time that it takes with our version 3.0. Now, one of the advantages of using OneNote is you get to use this digital pen so, and I, I did this in the previous example, we can very easily go out and annotate something. So I'm just using my pen to annotate. And the advantage to this is I can literally draw, if I need to outline South America here, it's on my screen, on my device right here, and I have the pinpoint precision of this digital pen. So I can very quickly come out here and outline the coast of South, South America there. Okay, did everybody hear that okay? Sounded good. All right, great. Uh, this is adaptable for any subject area. And the, the hardest thing, I've, I've also called this note streaming in the past, and people get hung up on the live streaming concept and things like this, but I want to focus on the pedagogy behind this. This is a OneNote notebook that's being shared. That means that as I am writing, drawing, no matter what the subject area is, that digital inking is going to the student's mobile phone in real time or their desktop or their laptop, uh, you know, whatever it might be. So that persistence is so important. We talked about, you know, some of the pedagogy things like repetition, space practice, retrieval, rehearsal, all of those things. Well, in order to do any of those, you need to go back to the source material, and that's where just OneNote just shines uh, with that, so you can re repeat. So that persistence is very, very important. Okay, Microsoft Forms example. Again, this could be in a face-to-face -face class. We've done many of these in face-to-face -face classes, but it can also be adapted for online learning. Whether you're operating in a synchronous environment, you know, at the same time, or an asynchronous mode, this particular method works very well in a synchronous environment where you're wanting to uh, kind of share information. Cal showed the example of the social emotional, you know, how are you feeling? Just to kind of take a quick poll. Microsoft Forms does that very easily. So here's another example using OneNote embedded Microsoft Form. And then whenever I hit submit, it will go out there, return immediately. So I can see I, as the student taking this quiz, I received two out of two points. And then if I would like, I can come up here and go to this particular page for my OneNote notebook. And since I haven't limited this, I can submit multiple responses out there. Let me bring up a browser. So right here we can see in near real time, this is the output of our Microsoft form. So we've got one vote in essentially. Let me add a second vote here with my form and let me get this correct. So Mars, Earth, 
And whenever I hit submit, within a matter of a couple of seconds, we're seeing in near real time. Okay, and I'll pause that one there. So the, the idea behind that is you can very quickly get a, a, a kind of a pulse on the class, you know, how, how are things going? This also works very well uh, for distance education, just kind of on a scale of one to 10. How are, how are you uh, feeling about the material that we're covered? Are you having technical difficulties? One, I'm having you know a terrible time with technology and 10, the technology experience is great. So ask students, you know. Uh, this one's not a, a YouTube video, but a PowerPoint recording. Many of our faculty do not know that PowerPoint will record slideshows and do screen recordings. And as Mike mentioned at the top of the show, we also now have Microsoft Stream uh, that allows us to record the screen the other thing that's kind of a game changer with stream is it does automatic transcripts which means that those transcripts are deep searchable so let's say that cal was teaching a math lesson and he was talking about sine cosine and tangent well if his videos are uh, transcribed within microsoft stream a student can go in there and type the word cosine and it will take them at exactly the point that he mentioned cosine at one minute and 12 seconds click on that link and you're there so very very powerful technology Using multiple devices with OneNote. Um, this is another thing that BYOD, bring your own device. Is that a stumbling block or a stepping stone because we have such a wide variety that we have to support? Take advantage of what we've got. You know, I'm a big fan of that. So let's just play this example here. A lot of possibilities. Again, another OneNote example. So I am on my, uh, on my mobile phone in the uh, teachable moment section. I'm going to go out here and add a picture. Now I have a tray of rocks and minerals here that I would like for my students to see a little bit closer. Uh, so I'm going to come out here and I'm going to capture a photo from my device's camera. And I'm just going to come in here, focus on whatever it is I'd like to take the picture. And I'm going to say OK. And whenever I do, OneNote is immediately putting these, uh, this picture into the OneNote notebook on my mobile phone, but it's stored to OneDrive. So eventually you'll see that appear here. And sometimes, okay, so another example. So that's one of our answers for that laboratory work that's so difficult to do. Whenever you're sharing something, it's like everybody gather around, we only have one specimen. Um, we're also using Microsoft Teams and the Teams meeting feature. Uh, we've got a biology professor doing dissections and things. You have to you know, think outside the box and able to do some of uh, that type of work. And actually says some, actually that's sometimes better than a face-to-face -face classroom because now then everybody's in different locations, but they're seeing you know, an up close picture of the process. Green screens, I've done a lot of work with green screens. They're very easy technology to use. I use free open source software. I use a $50 webcam. So the other philosophy we have here is we're using what we have. Uh, we don't have a big budget for any of this, so we have to get very creative with what we do. The little pop-up studio you see up there at the top, I can check that out to faculty. They re can record their lessons. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention that Cal had touched on earlier, you, you can see I talk with my hands, that facial expression, all of that. Cal was talking about that. That's an important piece. And another thing in distance education we talk about is instructor presence. So that's just another way that students can get a little bit more, uh, you know, better, better uh, uh, experience uh, being able to see the teacher than just typing something, you know, with just a discussion board or something like that. And then lastly, since this is on innovative pedagogy, uh, I like to kind of push the bubble a little bit. Being a university, we like to, to uh, spread the, the limits out there of knowledge. And this is some work we did about three years ago using the mixed reality goggles. And if you haven't seen these, this is just a set of goggles. And yes, I know you look goofy when you put these things on, but I'll take one for the team here. But this is truly an immersive experience. This video doesn't do it justice, but what you're seeing is, if you can imagine a 360 degree view, with those goggles of me in this cliff house and I open a OneNote notebook in a room and I wanna take advantage of some assistive technology of the dictation and the immersive reader. So this is using mixed reality in OneNote and we'll just play a sample here. Do some things like dictate. So now then, whatever I am speaking, it's going to begin typing. So in a virtual environment, uh, rather than bring up that on-screen keyboard, that would be very difficult for me to punch one letter at a time. So I'm just using the dictate feature within OneNote. And in the interest of time, I will pause that there. But you saw my spoken word was converted to text. 
that's kind of fun to do an experiment because you can have these different rooms uh, available out there and open a one note notebook for this class in this room and go down to the science room and then go to the math room. It's just kind of a fun to experiment that you don't actually travel. It's called teleport. Uh, you just teleport from one room to the other. Open this up from your OneDrive file shared with everybody. What I just typed right there would go directly to the students into their notebook. So with that, I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to Mike here. And do I need to stop presenting? Oh no, that no, this is great. I'll um, what I'll do is I'll just share on my end. That was man, incredible. Uh, I never get sick of watching some of the, the onboarding and some of the the VR stuff. That is a uh, that's some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, um, I'll just leave my video off. It's just, yeah, just take a second here. Okay, well, thank you both Cal and Tom for showing a wide range of stuff, a bunch of really cool stuff. I think that a lot of people can get inspired by and do themselves for distance learning. And just a recap of the updates. We've got the special education page for early learners. And that's out as of last week, late last week. That link is there. We also have the highly capable and twice exceptional mech page. That's also out as of last week at the same time. And then we have the new YouTube playlist. All the video and screen recording quick tips and tools. We've been adding more and more. Stream just rolled out this week. It's global in North America. Tom just got it two hours ago. I bet Cal has it by now too. So check out that screen recording playlist. And then this whole PowerPoint, this is a really good one. PowerPoint will be probably tomorrow morning. We'll be posting that one. We'll have the whole video on the YouTube playlist. And then we have the support link here. So if you have any questions about support or you're having any issues, please feel free to file a ticket. We have experts who can help out that are just dedicated to helping out teachers and schools. And other than that, a couple of Starting next week, we've got dyslexia and distance learning on Monday. Virtual graduations and Teams live events. That's actually a, a popular topic right now, our virtual graduations. And so we're going to have a whole show dedicated to how to do those with Teams live events. And then Minecraft education during remote learning. That's another really popular topic. And we have some Minecraft education and super. behind the scenes and we will see you soon.